Welcome to episode 51 of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Ann Frost, and this episode was recorded on January 14th, 2021. Today, I have a yarn review for you, some updates about the Morehouse Merino flock, some music, some musings. Let's get started. Welcome to the drawing room, everyone. I hope you are comfortably seated with your knitting and a cup of something warm, or that you're enjoying your workout or your drive, or that our chat will help your work pass a little quicker. I always like to start the show with a thank you. Many thanks to those who have left five-star reviews and kind comments over on Apple Podcasts. It really does help a great deal with making the show visible for those looking for knitting podcasts. Pearl Baby left a very kind comment toward the end of last year, and for some reason, the last time I looked, I couldn't see it. So sorry it took me a while to acknowledge that, Pearl Baby, and thank you. Also, welcome to Kate and Kelsey, my two newest patrons over on patreon.com slash I thought I knew how. Patrons help defray the costs of running the show, including buying equipment, paying for postage, covering hosting and software fees. In that way, my patrons really are filling the role of producers, and I am very grateful. If you'd like to help produce the show and receive some added benefits in return, hop over to patreon.com slash I thought I knew how to learn more. I have a few things to catch you all up on. First, the dryer balls I talked about last episode. So these were the ones I made from my yarn scraps last year that had felted a bit, but not well enough for them to fully stay together. I used some longer bits of scrap wool to wrap around them and then felted them again. It was some Erin Waite Shetland wool from Jameson's of Shetland, so it should have felted fine, but I just could not get them to felt any further. So in a fit of peak, they ended up in the trash. I probably could have tried more to get it to work, but I had already put so much time in them and they were decidedly fighting back. So I called it a day. They won. This year, I'm still holding on to all my yarn scraps, but this time I'll be holding on to all of them, not just the 100% wool, and I plan to use them as I need them to stuff things with. I don't often do projects that need stuffing, so I think that the number of ends I produce should meet the need as life goes on, and I can eliminate the need to rely on polyfill. In fact, I used some just on Wednesday as I took part in a Mindful Mackin class. These classes are offered by Helen Robertson and are sponsored by Shetland Arts. They are free knitting sessions taking place on three Wednesdays a month through March. If you'd like to join in, the last I checked, there's still spaces. It happens at 8 a.m. Eastern time, which may make it difficult for some of you to attend. While it's sponsored by Shetland Arts, it's available for free to anyone worldwide. There is more information at shetlandarts.org. The sessions last an hour to 90 minutes. Helen has a little project for us to work on in that time. They're simple projects meant to give you time to knit without worry or self-criticism. A chunk of the time is spent working in silence so you can focus on the process and the sensory aspect of the knitting. You are encouraged to be mindful about the process, but it's not a woo-woo experience. Helen just gives you the space to do a little creative thing. The last thing I want to tell you about is that my to-do list plan that I mentioned in the last episode is building up towards working. You'll need to listen back to hear me go on about all my goals for this year. But the organizational tool I have for that is my to-do list that is topped with my list of six things I want to do every day and then space at the bottom to add my constantly changing list. I am to the point where I am consistent on three of the six daily things. None of them are the Master Hand Knitter program. I am hoping to add that piece in the coming week. The last year of doing basically nothing feels like a 50-foot wall that I need to get over before I start. But really, literally, all I have to do is sit down and open the binder and move forward. So yeah, hopefully the day this releases will be the day I actually open the binder. I believe in the value of taking a break, and I think rest can actually be an important part of any goal or creative process. But at a certain point, it stops being a pause and becomes full-on inertia. 
and I feel like I am fighting physics at this point. Let's have a song break now that I've caught you up on those things. When we come back, I'm going to have a yarn and pattern review for you. This song is from Lance Conrad, and it's called Walking in Tokyo. Yarns sent me some yarn a little while ago to take for a test drive, and I finally got a chance to sit down with it in the time between Christmas and New Year's. The yarn is their Monch Chunky yarn. That's M A U C H. It's a single 100% wool yarn. The yarn comes from New Zealand and the US. It's dyed as roving, and the colors are blended at that stage before being spun. So while there are some truly solid colors, Many of them have a nicely heathered look to them. Like the Forsythia I received is close to being a solid yellow, but it's been blended with something lighter to take the edge off so it's not glaringly yellow. The yarn is intended for felting, so that's what I used it for. 
I'll tell you about the pattern in a moment, but I want to finish talking about the yarn first. Uh, It knit up well. As with any bulky weight single, at times my needle tip split the yarn, but it was easy to tell that that had happened just by the feel and make a correction. Also, as a Z-twist single, it was building up some additional twist as I knit along with it. So just be aware that that might happen. It wasn't bad enough that I had to dangle my work or the ball or anything to let it untwist. I only mention this for the new knitters who may not have had the yarn behave like that before. That's It's normal. It felted really well. I have a front loader and I sent it through an entire cycle and most of the felting happened in that first cycle. After another cycle, it was pretty much done, but there were um, two areas that hadn't felted to the same degree as the rest of the bag. So I sent it through a third time. That time I didn't actually notice any additional felting and the two areas that hadn't felted still hadn't felted. So I got online to read up because I am not an expert felter by any means. I did a bag over 10 years ago and a pair of clogs this last year. And I think that's literally all the felting I've ever done. But apparently because the pattern I chose was a bag and it's knit up in the shape of a bag, it's not unheard of for there to be an area or two that doesn't lie right in the machine to get the agitation it needs to felt. So a few people out there recommended spot felting those sections using a washboard. That is one piece of equipment I do not have yet. (laughs) So I hopped over to Amazon and I got one ordered. It's just a plastic washboard. It's about 18 inches long and about nine inches wide. And it has the ridges on it. To be honest, I really dreaded having to spot felt those two places because it can take ages to felt something manually like a whole project. I manually felted those clogs and they took forever. And I expected that to be the case with the spot felting. So I filled the bathtub with hot water, just letting the household hot water fill it up. I didn't add any boiling water or anything to it. I added some shampoo to the water and I got to work. To my surprise, it only took about five minutes total to get those two areas as felted as the rest of the bag. And it was no special technique. I just ran those areas over the washboard and they shrunk right up. If I do end up with another felting project on my hands, this will be the yarn I choose. It's comparable to a bulky weight lopi. Only doing a comparison online, it's got 11 more yards per hank and it's a dollar less. Plus, speaking practicalities, Kramer Yarns offers the Mach Chunky in 57 different colors. And the online shops I looked for Bulky Lopi carried between 20 and 32 colors. If you wanted the super authentic experience of knitting an Icelandic sweater, go for an Icelandic spun Lopi. But I think the Motch Chunky would be a very suitable replacement that would allow you greater latitude for choosing colors and would be a little more affordable. Plus, at least for those of you listening from the U.S., with the state of international shipping right now, being able to order from within the U.S. is a definite perk at the moment. So yeah, two thumbs up for Mach Chunky from Kramer Yarns. I think I'm going to have a ball and a half left once the bag is done, so I'll need to look for something I can make up with the remainder. Felting is starting to grow on me, especially now that I know how helpful a washboard can be. I say I'm going to have a ball and a half left. I have not actually finished the bag. This might sound weird to you, given how felted projects normally work, where you knit them up and throw them in the machine and let it dry in shape and it's done. If I had proper respect for my time, that's the sort of pattern I would have knit to test this yarn. (laughs) But instead, I chose fashion. Somebody pointed me to Cindy Pylon's Ravelry store a while back. It may have been Jana from the Pearl Together podcast on YouTube. If not, I'm sorry to whoever it was who pointed me to her. As soon as I clicked through, I was so in love with her designs. Her whole pattern store is full of incredible stuff. Really clever puppets, wire ornaments, stylized animals, and it's not all felted. So even if you have no interest in felting, you should check it out. But her bags are what had me all excited. And there's one called the sweater bag that caught my eye. Because while the main bag is felted, there are elements added afterward that remain unfelted. The bag construction is pretty brilliant. You knit the main purse section as a massive rectangle. There's some minor shaping along the way, but for the most part, it's a rectangle. 
and then you pick up along one long side of the rectangle and starting from the midway point of the rectangle, you knit back and forth, closing the bag up as you go. It's a genius method that saves you having to seam it. The side of the bag that you're knitting um, eventually gets you to the top of the bag and becomes the shoulder strap. So you start knitting the shoulder strap. You repeat that on the other side and then you graft the two ends of the strap together. I hate seaming, so I am all about this construction method. After you felt the bag, you let it dry in shape and then you attach two knit panels to the side of the bag to form exterior pockets and you pick up through one of the top edges of the felted bag to knit the flap that then falls over the opening of the bag and is secured with a toggle. So those two pockets and the flap are done in a decorative stitch and those do not get felted. So I have not finished this pattern yet because it is still hanging over my tub drying out. But once it's dry, I'll attach the side panels and knit the flap And then I think this is going to go to my yellow loving daughter, who is also my seamstress daughter, so she can sew up a liner for it and I won't have to. (laughs) That said, the wool, the Mach Chunky, was so thick after felting that I think that this bag could survive well for quite a while before needing a liner. But you may as well start with a liner and keep it nice from the start. Anyway, I highly recommend that you check out Cindy Pylon's Patterns. All of her felted bags are so clever and totally worth a go. She really has a knack for giving something an interesting but doable feature. I think I am pretty sure I'll be back to check her out again in the future. And of course, look in the show notes. I'll have a link for you there. Have you been stalking the Knit New Haven Instagram lately? Linda has some great yarns that have come into the shop recently, including some Zabber Ball sock yarn that has me thinking I may just need to knit some socks after all. If you go over to Knit New Haven on Instagram and find the picture of them all there in the basket, it's the ball in the three o'clock position that is browns and greens and yellow and purple all marled together with a black. I feel like it would knit up with a subtle level of craziness, which is how I like to live my life. She also posted some yarn suggestions for Hohi Locatelli's Lightweight Hipster, which looks like a perfect shawl for spring or summer. There is a red in the Blue Sky Fibers Metallico that looks delicious. Have a peek at their feed and give them a call at 203-777-5648 to order. The website for online ordering is coming soon, but in the meantime, call and talk to Linda or a member of her staff. They are very knowledgeable and great to speak with. 203-777-5648. And of course, I'll have a link in the show notes. Have you heard that the Morehouse Merino flock is getting a brand new home in 2021? First of all, if you're not familiar with the flock, and you should be, I talk about it all the time, but if you haven't uh, followed through to check it out on Facebook, the Morehouse Merino flock is the Morehouse Farm knit along group, but it's not just any knit along group. It is a mutual admiration community. There is a strong focus on learning, building a mindful habit of daily knitting, and supporting each other on our journeys. Each month, we try a different project to learn or practice a new technique, and Erin has some amazing projects that will have us confidently double knitting, working fair aisle, including on the wrong side, working two at a time of anything so your socks and sleeves always match, thrumming, and even mirror knitting so that you can skip the purling. Erin has been looking for a home for the group that is away from social media that will make the flock truly ours, and she has finally found it. If you're ready for a distraction-free platform that you can plug into from anywhere with other like-minded knitters and more meaningful connections, for clear, concise instruction that gives you the right technique just when you need it, and access to your own virtual knitting instructor for help on any project, really any project, not just Morehouse patterns, so that you can build the skills to knit everything on your wish list with confidence, head over to morehousefarm.com slash flock so you can enter your email address to be among the first to know when the doors open. It's going to be about Valentine's Day. And if you skip the Avant or Tansy knit alongs because you're not on social media, no worries. They are already there waiting for you when this new location opens. 
It's very exciting stuff. I have been able to get a sneak peek at the new Morehouse Merino Flock Home online, and it's really great. Be sure you get over to morehousefarm.com slash flock and get on the list. I have my own Amazon storefront now. If you visit amazon.com slash shop slash I thought I knew how, you will see some idea lists of things I love. At this point, it's all knitting related things, but I hope to get in there and do a few more lists because first of all, one of my favorite things about our online knit togethers is getting your book and TV show recommendations. And I thought that would be a good place to keep track of those for everybody. But also we are working on reducing plastic waste in our household. And I know that that's an area that can be really tricky because you don't want to end up buying things that aren't effective. We have had more than our fair share of those as we made the switch, but we have found some things that work just as well or better than the plastic products we've been using before. So that list should go up soon. And in the meantime, you can find an ever-growing list of knitting books that I've read this year, my favorite pattern books, a special list of books that have helped me with the Master Hand Knitter program, gifts at various price points for knitting friends, and more. Any purchase you make through my storefront will help the show at no additional cost to you. Almost everyone shops at Amazon these days. Just by entering the website through amazon.com slash shop slash I thought I knew how, your purchase helps the show. Thank you again for all you do to keep this little project of mine running. One of the things I have been successfully doing on my daily to-do list so far has been to read every day from an actual book. And the reason why I have been so successful is in large part because I ordered a handful of knitting books for myself using a gift card. And rather than just sticking them into my library, I took the time to read through them before shelving them. A few I really enjoyed, but they have been around for a long time already, so I just want to touch on them. I had already read Alice Starmore's Erin Knitting. I feel like this book is on the shelves of most libraries. I know that's where I first found it, and I loved it so much that I went ahead and got a copy for myself. This one, along with her Book of Fair Isle, are excellent resources for those who want to learn about the history and the development of the techniques, as well as the techniques themselves. They both follow the same format, history and techniques with lots of pictures and evidence, followed by a collection of patterns written by Alice Stourmore in the respective styles. Most of the designs in these books, I would say, are timeless, though you may want to play with the colors some, which leads me to her book, charts for color knitting. If you're interested, be sure to pick up the new and expanded edition, which has a section added about choosing colors. At first look, you might think this is just a pattern dictionary of graphs of various color work charts, but there is so much more. She takes you through the design process she uses to decide how to combine motifs, how to place them, how to do the calculations for the patterns. The added section on choosing colors is also extremely helpful. It won't walk you through all the steps for all the different shapes of sweaters. All of her examples are designed for a very basic drop shoulder sweater, but it will give you enough information to get you started if you want to design any kind of pattern knit, not just color work. The other book I ordered is about two and a half years old, and I've been eyeing it for ages. It's mittens from around Norway, over 40 traditional knitting patterns inspired by folk art collections. This book is fantastic. Nina Granlund Sather went through various museum collections, recreated the patterns of preserved mittens, researched the stories behind them, and in some cases uh, gave them some practical updates. The book follows a set pattern for each pair of mittens. You get a page of history, a photo of the finished mittens, a page with the mitten graphed out, and a page with brief written instructions. The designs are wonderful. Don't think that you are going to be getting a book of Selbu style elaborately patterned mittens. There are some projects like that in this book, but the range of styles is really impressive. There is everything from your very basic plain mitten to Sunday mittens done in very fine wool with lace and cables to basic color work to the elaborate. It's the type of book that expands your understanding of a regional tradition beyond the stereotypes. It's really well suited to pretty much any knitter. Expert knitters will be pleased with some of the challenging patterns, but even expert knitters need quick mindless knits. And those who are ready to step past knitting basic dishcloths and scarves will be able to grow with this book, starting with the basic patterns and taking on more challenging patterns as their skills improve. 
I stopped editing several months ago, but I can't turn off my editor brain. (laughs) I know from being part of the creation process of many books in the past, how much work goes into putting them together. And this one really is a treasure for the amount of information, the number of patterns, and the quality of the writing and formatting. The list price is $26.95, and it is a steal at that price, given everything that it contains. These books had me all pumped up to read a couple of others I picked up, but unfortunately, the contrast between them let me down. Knit Like a Latvian is full of beautiful Latvian mittens and hand warmers, but only a tiny bit of history about the regional knitting at the start of the book, and then all the patterns follow. Had I not read this within days of reading mittens from around Norway, I think I would have been super pleased with the patterns that were included and just been happy with the book. But in contrast with the Mittens from Around Norway book, I felt the missed opportunity to convey some of that regional history and felt a little let down. I'm sure I'll get over it though, because the patterns really are amazing and I want to knit them all. And I don't know, create a dive pit full of mittens that I can immerse myself in my house. (laughs) Maybe next year, my ridiculous crafting goal can be to knit mittens for everyone I know. So yeah, Knit Like a Latvian. Without comparing it to other books, a great pattern book with a variety of regional patterns, worth picking up. Just don't expect an extensive amount of history to be included with it. The other book that was a letdown is really The Victim of Age. James Norbury's Traditional Knitting Patterns was first written in 1962 and then reprinted in 1972, and it looks it. The photos are black and white, and the graphs of the patterns were created before people were doing graphics on computers. So some of the notations are very old-fashioned. You can tell they sort of drew it out crisply and then sort of went over it with a marker. (laughs) Also, while I believe the history in the book represents the best research of the time, in the last 50 years, much more time and effort has been put into researching knitted textiles, and a lot of the history he presents as fact has been either disproven or added to. The patterns are still useful references. He pulled them from existing textiles from the various areas of Europe he talks about, but they will take some getting used to to interpret the notations, and you really should just steer clear of the history he provides. So there's a billion book reports in a few minutes time. I hope they're helpful. I think everyone should own mittens from around Norway. And if you want to pick up a few more, go for the Alice Starmore books on Erin Knitting, Fair Isle Knitting, and Charts for Color Knitting. You really can't go wrong with any Alice Starmore stuff. One more song before we go. This one is dedicated to my children who are both officially gainfully employed and getting to learn about things like taxes and withholdings. I'm so very proud of you both. This is It Ain't Cheap Being Poor by Benjamin Bostick. Well, it ain't cheap being poor And I can't take any more Of the tickets and the taxes and the fees I work hard for my pay And they take it away Like they don't care I got a family to feed They cut my shifts in the mail
a few more things before I go. I have so many things that I want to do this year, and not even just this year. Some of these things are big enough that they're going to be multi-year projects, and I really cannot wait to tell you about them. But the way the world is right now, with plans having to change, I really do have to wait to tell you. As I said, some of these things are pretty big, like scarily big things, things that on their own are scarily big. But because I don't have access to the help to do these scarily big things, they're even more scary and big uh, because I have to do them on my own or with the help of a very patient husband. More than ever, it would be exceptionally helpful if you could tell your fellow knitters about the podcast, share about it during online knitting meetings, post the episode announcements on your social media. If you have an in-person or online store and would be willing to include my podcast business card with your customer purchases, please let me know and I can send a stack of them to you. My ability to get the help I need to do some of these scary big things is in many ways tied to the number of downloads and social media followers I have. That's just how things are done these days. There is a new website coming. I'll be creating more YouTube videos. But in the meantime, this is an open blatant request that if you enjoy the show, please help spread the word about it to other people. I so very much appreciate your help. Again, these big ideas are in a tricky planning stage, so I cannot talk about them yet, but I can say with a solid surety that you will love them. And my goal in doing this is to help spread the love of craft, knitting, creativity, and entrepreneurialism, and to encourage borderless kindness. But I need help to do that. And in order to get that help, I need help. A reminder that the Tansy Knit Along is finishing up in the Morehouse Merino Flock group. However, as I said before, the Morehouse Merino Flock Knit Alongs exist in perpetuity. So if you're starting late, that's totally okay. The one prize for this knit along is a copy of Morehouse Farm Merino Knits. It's full of patterns for all ages and your home. It's a great book. The giveaway is open to anyone worldwide who posts a photo of their finished tansy to the I Thought I Knew How Facebook group by January 31st. I'll pick a winner and contact you through Facebook for your mailing information. I know I'm saying Facebook, Facebook. People in the MeWe group, you can also post your finished item to the MeWe group. Thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash I Thought I Knew How to make a monthly pledge. You may also consider making a purchase from one of our sponsors by visiting the website I thought I knew how familypodcast.com and clicking on the link at the top that says be a booster. While you're on this site, you can also find the show notes for each episode. Thank you so much to my patrons, to Knit New Haven, and to Morehouse Farm for sponsoring the podcast. Find me on my social media accounts as I thought I knew how, except on Twitter where it's just thought I knew how. The groups on various platforms are all called I Thought I Knew How Podcast. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joins, and plenty of time to knit.